So again, we've got create new. And I'm just going to select um, A4 here. And as I said, you've got your advanced settings here if you want. I'm going to change that to RGB because we're going to submit to an online journal. Um, we're going to nature comms. <laughs> um, click create. And now this is your workspace. So there are, there's a bunch of shortcut keys and keyboard sh shortcut keys. I'm not going to go through them too much today just for time, but just um, bear with me. So you can zoom in and zoom out with the plus and minus. And they're also a little bit different between the Mac and PC, so I won't go over the shortcut keys too much. Um, you've got your little hand tool here, which you can move around. You can also select, and, and if you press the space bar, you can also, holding down the space bar, you can move around as well. Okay. So this is called an artboard, and we can make more artboards, so you can have multiple artboards as well if you want. Um, and you can do that by, you'll see here if we've come over, I'm just going to actually make this full screen. So we're taking up all the screen. Ah, there we go, make that a little bit bigger. So here we've got different things. We've got the properties, we've got layers, we've got libraries, artboards. Some of these things you never use. Um, you can change the window if things aren't appearing, for example. So for example, control, that's disappeared. I like to have it up there, so I'm gonna have that back there so you can re-enable and then disenable things. Does that make sense? Um, there are different ways to view it. It's really up to you how you want to have your workspace. I like to have it like this, um, but you can have it um, se separated so you're not in the window, all these kinds of things. We're going to start with, uh, let's just do some text. So if we click on the text tool, you can hold again down and you've got these different kinds of text options here as well. The standard one is just the top one, so we'll just go with that to begin with. And we're just going to click and we can type in tool. Um, Andrew is awesome. There we go. Now, with this kind of text tool, it's just a straight text. And what you'll notice is if um, is I can make that bigger. So if I hold down shift as well, it'll keep it in the right thing. And I haven't even spelled my name right. There we go. So it's now bigger. I can change these from lots of different places. Again, there's multiple different ways to do this, but I'll just show you one today so we don't get too lost. Um, we can change that to something a little bit more useful, say Helvetica. It always defaults back to Myriad Pro, but most journals don't like that. So again, Helvetica is pretty much standard. Uh, I would probably just stick with that because you know you're not going to have any problems. You can change the font size to be something specific, 14. I'm going to make it bigger just so that everyone can see what I'm doing um, just for today. Zoom in a little bit. There we go. Okay. Um, what you'll notice though is if... I do this, it doesn't resize it. You know, it, it actually takes that and squishes it up and things like that. All right, so I didn't want to do that. So if you're wanting to actually have, say, a box of text where you've got multiple things, if for just a simple label, like you just go, this is lane one, lane two, lane three, that kind of text is great. But if you're going to write a little bit of a paragraph or something like that, just hitting click on the arrow on the text tool like this and just creating something like that, is going to be a bit annoying. What you might want to do is actually just holding down, drag out the area that you want to type in. And now you'll see that you're getting a box of text and as you resize it, it'll reshape it. So for example, we're just going to, um, I'll grab some text from somewhere. Actually, I can probably just grab it from here. Let's say I just grab this box of text here. And we'll paste it back in here. And now, when I resize this, you'll see it resizes. It doesn't make the text go crappy. It actually resizes and, and changes it to the shape. So they're the, they're the two sort of main ways that you're going to use your text. You can also rotate text, do things like, or like that. Which in this case, that doesn't work that well. But for these kind of boxes, you can make them go at angles. If you hold down the shift key, it'll lock it in to 45 degree changes. Does that make sense? All right. Is there any questions on the text tool? No. The only thing. Uh, yeah, this one tends to have lines under the text, and you'll have this little extra little um, square here, which I've just done something, and I don't know what I did. That's quite common in Illustrator. You're going to be like, what have I just done? Um, 
Whereas this one, uh, I don't think it's got that little box there. And I've just done something there that I don't know what I've done. There we go. Cancel that. Um, undoing is very useful. <laughs> <laughs> just going back. All right. So that's your basic sort of text tool. All right. So the next thing that we're going to do is you're probably going to want to draw a line or a shape. So the, the line tool is what I tend to use. You can use the pen tool as well, but I just tend to use a line tool. Um, again, there's, again, there's dozens of different ways you can do something. And it's pretty simple. You can just draw lines. Um, they won't actually have something by default. They'll just be because you can turn these into something called guides as well, which we won't get into, but um, just to know that it is. But you have to give it a little bit of something. So if you come up here to the stroke, you'll see a stroke. You can make that thicker. So you can make that as thick as you want. You can change the color during that. You can also click on here. This is your stroke here. And you can also just pick the color that you want there. If you just click often as well, it'll come up with this option for everything and it'll just have a predefined thing. So you can also input exactly what you want, but I find that kind of annoying, but it, you can just do that and it'll import a, a line as well. Does that make sense? Shape tool, same kind of thing. So you got, if you click on it, you can now make a shape. You can draw out the shape. If you hold down shift key, it'll keep it constrained. So you have now a perfect square. If you ungo shift, you can make it of any kind of a shape. You now have the option of filling that in. So you could say, fill that in with black. Um, you can also, I'm just going to make this bigger so we can see it. You can also grab on these little corners. And now you can make a rounded box if you want. Drag that out. Does that make sense? Um, you can also, often getting rid of the fill is kind of going to be useful because you might just want to make an empty box with a black line and a thin thing like that. Cool? Easy? Again, you can mm -hmm. rotate as well. So if you select on that, you can rotate these boxes. If you just hover around the corner, you can rotate those around to be any sort of shape that you want. Okay. All right. So we've got lines. We've got basic shapes. I'll run through as well. So you can, if you... Um, again, if you just click, it'll come up and you could make, if you have a predefined one, you say you want to make something of 50 uh, rectangle, 50 pixels, you can, you can define exactly what that is. Um, again, if we hold down in here, we can make different kinds of tools. So we've got the ellipse tool here. So I'm just going to make a couple of circles, for example. All right. Now, let's make a figure. I think we've got the basic kind of things there that you want to do, but obviously... Making a figure is probably something that you're going to be interested in. So I've got some files here. I just have to find where they are. It was in, I should have had these already ready to go, but anyway. Um, here we go. So here's a Western blot. I'm just going to drag that into Photoshop and we're going to switch over and do a little bit of a demo on Photoshop now. We're going to run through some basic kind of things. So here's what your image looks like. Um, you got that's all right, but I want to. I'm not really happy with the exposure on some of this. So what I might do is the first thing um, I'll often do is I'll create an adjustment layer. So adjustment layers are great because it's non-destructive editing. So you could edit that image directly if you wanted to, but it would be hard coded into it. So you could change the levels and things like that. Um, but what I prefer to do is an adjustment layer, which is essentially creating a layer on top of the image and saying. Um, and editing that and leaving the uh, raw image below it with, uh, un unedited. So it's, um, it's a great way. So you might want to change the levels, for example. Um, so now we've got this adjustment layer. It, it brings up this little box here now where you can see the levels. And now you can play around with the levels. Okay, I want to get rid of some of those things. You're allowed to play as long as what you do to the whole gel is consistent, you're allowed to do that. That's absolutely fine, you're allowed to do that. Um, I wouldn't do too much, like obviously they don't like it when you do this. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to do that. But if you, 
Uh, so for what we can see here, it's a bit hard to see, but if you're just pulling in to make it so that it's within the dynamic range, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Uh, for, yes, so I mean, as long as what you're doing to the gel is the same across and you're not doing it to specific bands, so doing this for example, whereas if, say, I'm just going to go, uh, I want those little things there to look better, and I'm going to create a uh, adjustment layer on that, and oh, we're just going to make that look really good. <laughs> That is a big no-no. Do not do that. Um, otherwise, um, you'll get in trouble. It's just not, it's, it's not good science. It's very, very bad science. Um, what you'll see here is um, layers. So this is another thing that we just uh, briefly mentioned in the introduction is the use of layers. So we can see here that we're using layers on this. So these are adjustment layers. So we're not actually editing the original image. So we can go and get rid of those and we're back to the original image. So you can qu very quickly turn on and off and see whether or not you have done anything that's illegal, or whether you've just made it look a little bit prettier so that you can highlight what it is you're wanting to show. Um, so you, we can delete those and get rid of the layer. Sometimes it requires two clicks. Um, and then what we can do is once we've got that and we're happy, so say for example this is what we want to do, and we can now grab a box. Now the other thing that often is, this one's actually not too bad, it's actually pretty straight but sometimes the gels rotated a little bit. So this one at the bottom, for example, is rotated. We can image and we can go to, uh, sorry, edit, transform, and we can rotate that image a little bit. Oh, sorry, I think I've got on the wrong thing. Select the actual background first. Uh, and we need to unlock that. Transform and now we could rotate it and this one here I think is a little bit Rotated that way just the way that's the way we took the photo and we're like oh we want to make it square when we put it on there so we're just going to rotate that around and We can do it manually like this until you eyeball it and looks okay And we just draw out our square and see whether it... Okay, that's all right the problem with doing it that way is that you tend to have a problem with the background like that. So it's where you have to sort of just be careful with how you rotate the images and whether or not you've got a black background and things like that that's going to cause a problem. So sometimes there's not much you can do. So with this one, it was cut a bit too close, so we're just going to have to probably go with the fact that... Um, because if you put an image with zero pixels in it, it'll get flagged by any decent journal as being wrong. Anyway, once we're happy with it, um, we're just going to copy and we're going to paste that in. So what we can do is you go File and you Copy Merged. That's going to copy all of the layers that you've got. And the, you can also save this as a TIFF and then import it, but the easiest way is you're just going to copy and paste directly into Illustrator. So we're just going to switch back to Illustrator and paste it in. There's your image. Okay. It's not going to look, depending on what you, you set, if you set 72 DPI or 300 DPI for your raster effects, it'll look a certain way on here. So it's not going to be the optimal resolution necessarily. It'll depend on what resolution that image was. So it's just going to be drawn at a certain resolution on your screen. It will actually be a higher resolution probably when you output it. Does that make sense? Um, there is... Um, when you drag and drop like that, it will embed them automatically. If you bring an image in, so if I was to say just drag this in, the image will come up with a cross. That means it's linking. It's actually just linked back to the original file, which is fine if you keep all of your files in the same place and you're not going to send this to anybody. But if you try and send this file to somebody with a linked image, that image will disappear because when they open it up, they won't have that linked file unless you send the linked file along with it. Does that make sense? So it can be handy if you're wanting to say, you put like a, a blot there and you're like, oh, I might edit that again later in Photoshop. So if you have that linked, then you can just go and edit the original image and it'll update in the Illustrator file. So there is a use for linking. I often find it kind of annoying because I always forget about it. Um, so I just embed them, okay? Does that make sense? Get rid of that. So there's our blot. One thing that I've found is you, I, I like to draw boxes around all my blots. Um, you can do that just by getting the rectangle tool 
and drawing a box around it and that's one way to do it. The other way is you can actually select the image and it's a little bit hidden but if you click on the mask button it'll bring allow you to then um, just bring up this option and now you can just create a, a, a thing a, a box around it and it'll perfectly be out around the outside. There we go, so we've now got a western blot um, on our image. We'll quickly go back and we'll grab the other one just for, so we've got two western blots there. Copy that in, paste it in. All right, so now we've got two western blots. I'm gonna just drag that out. I've got smart guides turned on. So if we go to window, uh, sorry, guides, uh, smart guides turned on. So this is gonna help just snap lock things into place for you. So it's they're useful to have on. I, some people like them, some people don't. I like to have them on just because it makes, when you'll see when it's moving around, it's giving you these options and it's gonna say, uh, that's snapping in lock and it just helps get things quickly to size. You can also select that object and you could say, I want that to be a specific width. So I'm going to say, let's make that 140 millimeters and I'll make that there. And then I'll do the same thing to this one on the width up the top here, 140 millimeters. And now they're both perfectly the same width. We'll just quickly go again, we'll just get mask. And we now have our Western blots. We can group those together if we want. So we can group them. The shortcut key is Command G, or we can go to Object and Ungroup, Object, Group. So now they're grouped together, they're gonna to stay together, and you can make them the same size, etc. very quickly and re reposition them. Cool. All right, I'll make that a bit bigger just so you can see it. Um, so what we might want to do is make different layers. As I said, layers can be very helpful when you're doing multiple different things. So we've got a western block here, and then we're going to have um, a graph we're going to import from Excel. So I'm going to make a new layer, which is this one here. It's very hidden down the bottom, but hopefully you can see it. It's all the way down the bottom here. There's little icons here. Create new layer. So now we've got layer two. All right. You can rename that. So I can call that westerns, and I'll call this one... Excel, and now we're going to get an Excel graph and we're going to import that in. So I'll just go back, I shouldn't have shut down where I had all my files. Okay, so here's an Excel graph, and it's just a volcano plot of some RNA seq data. Um, so I've already pre formatted a little bit. Um, we'll see here, if we look at the text, we've got the default Microsoft font, which is Cubbery. So the easiest way, again, is you can export this as a PDF or something like that if you wanted, and then import it if you like to have all of your figures separately. But again, the easiest way is to just um, select the graph, copy it, and paste it in. And it should work. But what we're going to see if I zoom in is, oh, bugger. It's done something crazy to my text. So what you need to do, especially if you're going to be working with Microsoft Excel, is change the font to Helvetica. <laughs> okay. We'll copy that again, and we'll switch back, and we'll paste that in. There's thousands of data points, so it's going to take a few seconds. And now you can see, hopefully, if I zoom in, all of those fonts are now correct. Cool. Now, that's all right, but I'm not super happy with how Excel graphs look, and I want to make it change a little bit different. I might want to make the font a little bit bigger on things, but keep the graph a certain size. So this is where it's really handy to ungroup everything and get rid of all of the clipping masks that have got imported with Excel. So what we can do again is go to Object, and go to Clipping Mask, and go Release. And it should, it's going to take a few seconds because it's going to release everything. And now we can start editing all aspects of that graph and make it change a little bit. So for example, I want to get rid of that outside box. 
and there's often multiple ones. So often what I do is I just select around an area where there's nothing and I just delete that and it gets rid of all of those empty clipping masks that are going to get in the way. Does that make sense? So now I can go and start editing things. So if, say for example, I wanted that font, I wanted that to be a bit bigger. So I'm just going to make that a bit bigger at 12 size, size font. I'm going to move that around. These fonts down here, for example, way too small and I was getting annoyed trying to figure out how to do them in Excel to make it look pretty. So let's make them nice and big for this. So I'm just going to make them bigger. And I really not too fussed on that grid actually. I might get rid of that grid. So I'm just going to select that and I'll just delete it. There we got that. You know what? Black is not a particularly nice color. So I'm going to select all of those dots there. And I think we should be able to change it. Or have I selected something here that I don't want? I can change one of these, for example. So I can say, let's make that one red. Now that one's red. Maybe I want to select a couple here. I can again change them to something different. They're blue. Maybe we'll make them something that will stand out. Purple. Now you can start editing things, which you couldn't do easily in Excel, yeah? You couldn't go and change the color of one dot to be something that you wanted, but now very quickly I've changed the colors to things that I want them to be. So if you're wanting to highlight a certain item, you can also go in and say, look, this was a really important data point and I wanted to highlight that. Again, I'm not changing the data per se, but I'm just visually making it look a little bit better. Does that make sense? Obviously don't do things that you shouldn't be doing. You, you, oh, that data point I just want to get rid of. That's not allowed. <laughs> but it does mean that you can just, it's just tweaking your data to make it look pretty. Yeah, but not altering the data itself. Exactly. So say, for example, um, I wanted to go, look, I really want um, all of the overexpress genes to be shown in a certain color. So I'm going to change those to be red. And I'm going to show the underexpressed ones to be all in blue. So I'm going to change that to be blue. I'm, it's not necessarily the best example, it's just a graph where we can show how you can edit things to make them look different or get a specific colour scheme that you wanted to use for some, something. Okay. Um, Alright, so the other thing is, uh, that graph's way too big, so I'm just going to resize it. I'm going to keep everything the same again, but I've now made that smaller. The fonts have obviously got smaller, so I want to go back and I want to change those and make them legible, so I'm going to just pick them as a 10 point font. And I like to have a box around everything, so I'm going to create a box to go around my, my graph. And I can just put that like that. Obviously, don't want it to be filled with anything, but I want to give it a nice stroke, and I'm going to change that to black. Oh, cancel. And then right there. There we go. Cool. So now we've got an Excel graph. Oh, you can, but say um, when you the the it, this is where we'll actually come to selecting. So what you'll notice is that I'm in PowerPoint. You have to select everything of the object to actually move it. In this, I only have to catch the tiniest little bit of that, and it'll select it. Okay. Uh, yes. So where that where layers is helpful. So I'm just gonna I'll just group that together for a second. If I move that, say you've, uh, say for example, this is you paste something new in, and it happens to paste on top of another object. Um, I'm going to just lock the westerns below, and now if I go to select that item, it's only going to select the graph that I wanted. If that was unselected, and then it would select everything. And also, if you're on the same light, so and if they're on the same layer, you don't have that option now to just go just turn off that westerns. Does that make sense? So that's where it gets helpful. If you've got, graph, especially when you've got a, a multi-panel figure and you've got things starting to get really close to each other, mm -hmm. it gets difficult sometimes to select the bits you want to select. So just separating them out means you can just very, very quickly turn on and off <coughs> a layer, which means it locks it in place and now you can edit the other bits. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's where layers helps. And it also just means like if you're unsure where something is, you can just turn it off. And especially when you're getting very complicated figures, um, with lots of different light, um, different objects overlapping each other. It just helps a way of organizing. For simple things, you may not need to do it, 
but um, for when you start getting on more complicated figures, it can be helpful. I should not have chosen something with 10,000 data points. <laughs> All right, so what we'll do is, the other thing is I know everyone uses a lot is PRISM. So I'm just going to show you the difference between Excel and PRISM. Um, not really any difference. Um, again, here's the actual same data. So let's just skip that version. Um, there are a couple of different ways you can export from PRISM. You can export this, and I normally just use PDF, but you could use EPS as well as, uh, as a PDF. Um, either of those two options would work. PDF is probably the best option because it will take it as a vector image. You, can't copy it. you can copy it as well. Um, but if again, if you like to have all your specific data files exported from um, this, just I would, I would use PDF because it will keep all of the text and everything as a vector, and then you can import that directly in and edit it within. Um, you know, and I normally just use a uh, clear background. Um, if you export as a PNG or as a TIFF or something, you're converting it to a pixel-based image and therefore when you import it, it's not going to scale particularly well. But the easiest way is just to copy it and again, switch back to Illustrator and just paste that in. Again, so we can just move that around. You'll notice that... Um, It's basically the same. You have a little bit better. I, I prefer how graphs look from Prism compared to Excel, but you do have that option to once. That's the great thing about Illustrator is you can now get Excel Excel graphs to look a little bit nicer, whereas you couldn't really do that in Excel particularly well. But you can now get equal. So they look fairly much similar. Again, we could edit all of these things. So I could then, again, I'm just doing a very dodgy job here, but you know, just changing the colors as you need to and changing the font size, all of that's editable. Whereas often they aren't really editable once you put them as a TIFF or something like that, you can't quickly change the font size. So that's where Illustrator becomes useful. Again, you couldn't do that in PowerPoint. You could if it was an Excel graph, but if you tried to import that from Prism, it probably wouldn't allow you to edit a lot of the things in PowerPoint particularly well. So this is where the power of the whole program comes in. All right. Is that any questions? Yeah. Uh, so if that's on you did like doing your whole releasing of all of the things at the start, do you have to do that on every clipping? It depends on what it is and where it's coming from as to how many clipping masks it will have. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, often from um, Prism, it, you don't get as many. Mm -hmm. So it tends to work a lot better, especially when you're just copying and pasting it. It's because it's, it's a vector image in that, it seems to paste really well into Illustrator. Okay. So they're, they're nicely <laughs> matched. Whereas when it's coming from Excel, it tends to not, you see you get corruption of things like the, the font and stuff, so you tend to have a few more clipping masks, it doesn't cope it as well, so it tends to be a bit more work. Um, the one thing that we'll do now is, I'll just come back here, is um, we'll bring in something from the web. So um, this is where you've got, say, an SVG or a PDF of data from the web. So in this case, this is just an Onca print, um, and these are normally kind of annoying to try and deal with, um, you can't really use them in a publication particularly well because you just sort of have to crop them and paste them as is, but maybe they don't fit how you want them to in the figure. So what you can do is you can just open them up directly. I normally just drag and drop them onto the icon. If you're on a Mac, it works great. Another reason to be on a Mac. <laughs> um, again, so here you can select everything and you want to release all the clipping masks because a lot of these things aren't, as you click on it, everything just is selected at once. So you can't really just do anything with it other than move it around. So we're gonna, gonna release all those clipping masks. Oh, hang on, control A. Just select everything and then go to release. Oh, it's not releasing for some reason. There we go, release them with the shortcut key. Um, and now, uh, just gonna release all of those. Sometimes you have to do it a couple of steps. It have to go through releasing, selecting everything, releasing before you can start um, editing things. Ungroup helps too. So now we can actually access the bit. So for example, I just wanted that bit of data. So I'm just gonna copy that across and I'm gonna put that in my figure. And now I can resize it to make it fit onto without altering the data, of course. I'm gonna get rid of that figure. Oh, that's where having layers is helpful. 
I should have put that on a new layer. Get rid of that. Put that on a new layer. And now we're going to just line these up so that they look nice. Just imagine that they actually match each other in the useful data. And now we've got some data from the web and we've put it in and we've made it look nice. Cool. All right. Do we have any questions? No? I think that's probably enough for Illustrator and Photoshop for now. Not only like not Illustrator question perhaps, but what's the in terms of the font size on graphs and things like that, what's the do you think what is acceptable for uh, ten? Uh, yeah, look, most journals will have specific guidelines, so it's worth looking at it. But um, yeah, I'd say nothing less than an eight. Um, and they are most there are some good guides as well for making figures, and they they, they often suggest sort of around about a ten point font. Um, but it's really important. That's why I normally start with an A4 page. Is that is you make the graph on the A4 page to be a size that it was probably going to be printed in, because you can make something like this really big, which is inappropriate size for that. I would probably would have made that about half that size. Um, and then give a 10 point font for that because that's probably about the size it's going to be printed on in, in the actual page when you print it because you're thinking of you know multiple columns and stuff. Um, same with Western. So it's, that's where it's handy to have an A4 page as a sort of a layout and then scale things appropriately on that page, line them all up and then use a, a, a 10 point font or more. Any other questions? No? All right, who wants to see buyer render? Yeah, all right. We'll switch over to buyer render. Okay, so this is buyer render, and um, it's fantastic. <laughs> I'm not getting paid, unfortunately. Um, you can sign up for a free trial, so you can. I think you can make about five different images before they're going to start asking you to pay. Um, I think there are some. Um, if we have a look at the pricing. Um, it's free for personal use, you get five images, um, it's for educa educational use only so that's fine for us, but you're not going to get publication quality images out of it, it caps it at about 72 dpi. There's a few tricks I'm going to show you to get around that. Um, at least for your initial thing, so you can save it all up. What I would probably suggest doing is getting like a single user license and just um, get it for a month. Export all your images that you need once you've saved them all up and then cancel your subscription so you're not paying ongoing subscriptions if you don't want to. Um, that's one way to get around it. Otherwise, um, if lots of people start using it, perhaps what we can consider is looking at Anzac getting a site license or something like that to get multiple licenses. But again, that's you're looking at like $100 a month. So it's... Sorry, are you saying that you can create images without needing the licenses? Yes. Images? Yes. Okay. Yep. So we're going to run through that now. Yep. Okay. So that's... Um, sort of the pricing structure, just so you know. Um, but again, when you see how easy it is to make a figure, 35 bucks for you know making a figure that would take you a couple of days, it's pretty good value for money. So I don't think it's that much of a problem. Um, I'm just going to switch in. So once you sign in, this is what it looks like. Um, you've got uh, I've got a couple of ones I've already made here. So this is a, a figure I made for um, a paper that we just submitted. It's just a graphical abstract. So you can make, um, when you make a, a new workspace or a new image, it gives you this little um, w uh, watermark at the bottom. So you just make your workspace a bit wider and put your image on the left side and that way you can just crop it out. <laughs> <laughs> Hack number one. Um, the only downside, you're still going to get um, limited to 72 dpi, which when it comes to publishing, the journals will say that's not good enough, we need 300 dpi, but at least for submission, the images are actually pretty good quality still, relatively good quality, so you hopefully be able to get away with it. So this one took me, I think, about an hour to do, um, and I'll run through um, a new one just so um, you can know, see how you make it. So we'll just go back and uh, close this file, exit. So we're going to make a new one, so we'll just a new illustration. Um, it gives you a couple of um, predefined ones. I'm just going to use a custom, and again, I like to make it a bit wider, so we've got a bit, a bit more space. So I'm just going to make that 16 inches by 7. You can change that as you go as well. So if you're getting and going, oh, look, we're running out of space, and I want to get rid of that watermark, you can do that. Um, and then the cool thing is you, you've got all of these things. So 
uh, I'm going to just go, I really wanted to see something mitosis because I'm a cell cycle person. And you've got all these predefined icons here for things. And so you can just, it's just a matter of simply dragging and dropping it on there. Uh, I should have done this in the other. Um, Safari doesn't seem to work very well. It crops out the image. I don't know why. I'm going to have to figure it out. But um, Chrome or something like that seems to work. But we won't bother switching over for now. But just so you know, that's. I don't know why it does that. But it does that. It's a bit annoying. You can. Uh, no. So it, 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 sh it shouldn't be doing that. But you can. Yes, you can resize the images. No. Nah. Don't worry. I've already tried all of that. Um, didn't didn't do it. Um, you can change the colors very easily. So you can go, look, I wanted that to be something different for my color scheme. You can change the opacity. Um, and very quickly, so you can, we just go, for example, we're just going to get a, let's say we got a cell. And it really becomes just um, how in sort of inventive you want to be with your imaging. So you could drag this on drop and again, make that really big, you can rotate it around, let's make that a little bit more opaque, yep, uh, not so, sort of super uh, amount, so a lot of them sort of predefined, um, but you can sort of do things, um, so you know you could say for example now I've got something looking relatively interesting already, um, say we've got a receptor. Um, well, that looks interesting. Let's just dump that on the top there. We can edit it. So you can see very, very quickly you've already started creating something that looks pretty cool. Um, you know, you've got different kind of receptors you can stick on there. Uh, well, as I said, it's paid, so I'm not sure whether you actually have to. Well, I, I guess you just put that you used by render in your, in your in your methods, as you would just saying use Photoshop or ImageJ or whatever software you used. But in terms of citations, I don't know if you need to actually cite them. Uh, well, yeah, I'm sure they want people to mention that they use by render. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, and there's there's thousands of you can also request. So the other thing that you can do is you can also upload. So um, you can, for example, upload a, a file. Um, and so I'll just this is one that I put in before. So you could you could make data figures. It just you don't. I wouldn't probably use it for data just because you don't have that flexibility of editing like you do in Illustrator. Um, so, and also because it is paid, you're locking in all of your data figures into something that's paid for, which. I'm not sure, but for doing sort of graphical abstracts and making that pretty picture for PowerPoint, like your summary diagram, I think this is a, a, a real great thing. Um, there's obviously you've got all of your predefined sort of drawing things as well, where you can do lots of, you know, all of your shapes already there. Um, there's or, there's templates as well, so you could, there's actually templates of certain things. So you might say, for example, uh, I wanted something on lung cancer, so I'm going to use that as a predefined template. And then I can go and edit that one. For example, I've got to give a seminar on lung cancer or something like that. Um, same thing goes for um, where's something that might be uterine cycle. No, I don't think anybody works on that here. Um, there was oh here we go. Here's a here's some mice one. People do lots of mice work here. So yeah, yeah, I've got a little mice anatomy. And there's all these kinds of things. So you can see very quickly. I needed a picture of a mouse to show that I was going to burn its skin or something. I've got a mouse already there, ready to go. Cool. Um, so once you've got your image, um, you can export it. As I said, it's going to lock you in to a PNG or a JPEG at 72 DPI, um, and it will do it with a with that watermark as well. But what I'll do is I'll just quickly flick back and I'll show you. Um, one that I've done previously. So here's oh, another one that I've made. This took me a couple hours, this one, and I made it all from scratch essentially, but you can sort of see how you can use objects to create things, and uh, I've made all that um, just by dragging and dropping objects and, and making something. Um, and so we'll just export that so you can sort of see what it would look like. And again, the image is on the outside here, so I'll just minimize. 
doesn't want to get rid of that. And that should be in my downloads folder. So here's that image now. And so you can see if we zoom in, it's a bit pixelated. It's not great, but it's not too bad. And for your first submission or for a PowerPoint presentation, it's probably going to be all right. Um, and then all you have to do is just simply crop out in whatever program, Photoshop or whatever, you can just crop that out. Oops. <laughs> got away without having to pay. <laughs> Done. So yeah, as you can see, trying to do that in Illustrator, that would have taken hours to make all of those little icons, especially when you're starting out. I'm not a very good drawer. Um, and so now it's just, I don't even, I'm not even going to bother trying to do all those complex shapes in Illustrator. I would just do them in render. You can, if you do pay, you can export them as an as a PDF or as an EPS file, and you could import them into Illustrator and play with them. I think there are some problems with the font again when we did that um, on a, on one, so it still doesn't quite handle the fonts particularly well. But it could just be an issue with um, I haven't got a full version to play with properly. But, all right. Any questions? I can show you the question. The question make a figure. Uh, um, I haven't yet. I, I, as I said, I've only used it for a couple of figures. I've only really been using it for about a month, I guess. And it's not something, I've, I, it takes like an hour, so you get things done so quickly, you're just like, oh, that'll do. But um, I think if I was using it more commonly you, and there was something I really wanted, then yeah. I think you might have to be paid maybe to get decent feedback. I'm not sure if they're going to give icons away to free accounts. <laughs>